Good day, everybody. My name is Max Edkins. I'm on the Connect for Climate program of the World Bank Group. We're coming to you live on Facebook on the Connect for Climate Facebook page. Please join the dis discussion from, with hashtag all for the green as well as hashtag SDG live because we're here live at the SDG Media Zone in the All for the Green Week in Bologna in support and under the uh, auspice of the G7 Italian Presidency. Thank you so much for my guest. Thank you for being with me. Uh, so on my right, we've got Luca Atanasio. Luca is a uh, journalist who focuses on the grander issues around mi forced migration and migration. And then uh, to my further right, we've got Kadir van Luizen. And Kadir is a photographer. And he documents a lot of the issues uh, relating to the migration, as well as the uh, environmental and climate uh, stories around that. So maybe, Luca, just to get started. So climate change is an urgent issue. We see the impacts already. We are the generation that are already living with the impacts, but we're also the generation that can solve it. So maybe you could start uh, elaborating a little bit on what impacts you're already seeing around climate change and environmental degradation, and what impacts that has on, on communities, local communities um, around the world. Last year, um, um, the Agency for um, Refugees of uh, United Nations, UNHCR, published a report saying that for the very first time we hit the record of 65 million people forced to migration all over the world, especially in sub-Saharan sub Africa, Middle East, uh, um, Minor Asia, and uh, Southeast Asia. And um, uh, this uh, incredible number, uh, which was never hit before, uh, the second record hit by humanity was during the Second World War, 50 million people forced to migrate, um, was due to many factors. And uh, the problem is that in many of these factors, there is always a, a kind of uh, climate change element, you know. It's not only war, it's not only dictatorships, it's not only uh, limited liberties that push people to go away. Unfortunately, there are many other, uh, there are factors very much linked to environmental uh, issues. When I went to Bangladesh, for instance, uh, uh, I went to Dhaka, the capital, which is at the confluence mm -hmm. between the two of the, of the biggest rivers in the world, the, the Gang, Gange and the Brahmaputra. And the two-thirds of the city was beneath, was under the, the water. And so I went, uh, the taxi was a kind of a kayak, uh, which brought me to the hotel, just to give an example. And an, ex an expert of the World Bank, which I, whom I interviewed, told me that uh, in some areas of Bangladesh, it is absolutely impossible to live. It's not... He, he didn't say it is difficult to live, it's absolutely impossible. Or else, uh, for instance, I'm, I, I, I've been working uh, uh, over the issue of the civil war in South Sudan. Very recently I interviewed uh, a number of representatives of the in NGOs, and they told me that 100,000 people were forced to migrate due to a terrible um, famine, okay? But they also told me that the famine was not due to natural reasons, but uh, mainly uh, was uh, uh, caused by the fact that the war uh, didn't make access accessible immense areas uh, of uh, South Sudan, which were not cultivated and last just left like uh, the desert, you know. So, you see, these people are called uh, forced migra migra migrants, and uh, very often this terrible uh, phenomenon is very much linked to climate change issues. Mm -hmm. and, and because we're live on Facebook, maybe just to compress that, so, so we've got human-caused climate change, which is, you know, our greenhouse gases being emitted into the atmosphere. That's warming the world. And the warming of the world is causing uh, the climate change phenomena that we're seeing, which is uh, uh, 
coming out as more erratic rainfall, as longer dry spells, uh, unprecedented droughts. Um, it's also raising the, the temperature of the oceans, which is causing ice to melt, which is raising the, uh, the sea levels. And those are the environmental drivers that then cause the social um, uh, conflict which results in migration, right? That's kind of the story. Yeah, kind of the story. And, and in Bangladesh, you explained that it's, it's a rising sea level in Sudan and, and maybe the, the Horn of Africa, it's, it's more of an extended drought. Um, maybe over to you, Kadir. So, Kadir, you put a visual face on a lot of these stories as a photographer and as a reporter on, on, on these issues. Maybe you could just express a little bit how you use your medium to tell these stories and, and, and what you've lo learned along the way. Yeah, but, I mean, first of all, I'm a journalist. Um, so I report what I feel that's necessary uh, that I report. I'm freelance, so I have some freedom to choose my, my own topics. Um, since I'm from the Netherlands, which is a country which is almost completely below the sea level, um, we kind of grew up with the sea and the fear of the sea. And it was striking for me over the years how, also in Holland, you know, we, the, the new generation doesn't fear the sea anymore because we feel protected. At the same time, we know now that the, ocean, that the oceans are rising and they rising even faster every year when new, new figures coming out. Um, and I was really trying to investigate uh, how urgent this is already. Because, you know, we have a tendency to think, well, the climate is changing and the seas are rising, but this is something which will be of concern for the next generation or even after. So I really did uh, research on, on regions in the world where, where it's urgent already and where people are evacuated already and if they, don't evac are, if they are not evacuated, they are evacuating themselves. Um, I called the, the project Where Will We Go? Yeah. Which is uh, uh, a very good question, because where will we go? Um, why is it so urgent? It's so urgent because like in Bangladesh, but in many other, many other countries or, or regions, when the sea rises, it doesn't have to stay permanently somewhere up to here before you have to leave. It, it means that the, that the the land gets saline because of seawater, that the drinking water becomes brackish, is not drinkable anymore. So people lose their livelihood and, and they will leave, they have to leave. And um, it's, it's amazing how many millions of people are adrift already and, and are not recognized as such. You know, I mean, now we make a distinction in the world between uh, refugees who are coming from Syria, Iraq, uh, Middle East, who are considered to be uh, refugees of conflict, and the rest is suddenly economic refugees, where many, many of them are already uh, leaving because of climate change. Um, and and they're, they're where they live, they can't live anymore. So they, they leave. And since there's no regulations and it's not recognized that you can be a climate refugee and can ask for asylum actually, being a climate refugee, I think we are getting ourselves in a big mess, which will only be much, much bigger than we can imagine. And, and that's often the story that's not told. Um, so in the Syrian conflict, the linkage is actually with the climate drivers that there was a extended unprecedented drought that resulted in uh, local migration of farmers into the cities, which created social strife. That underlying causage of a component of the Syrian conflict is not always reported on. And, and, and maybe you could elaborate on how does one actually make sure that the full story is told, that it doesn't end with, you know, there's conflict in a country, hence we've got migration, but more that there's conflict in the country because of this and this and this, with one of the causes also being environmental and climate-related issues? Well, you know, obviously there's a big role for the media. Um, and sometimes we do well and often we don't. Um, 
if you look at the media landscape nowadays and the budgets which are available and the number of, of really good investigative journalists or visual storytellers, it's, it's very limited. Because yes, every conflict, you know, I mean, mo probably most conflicts are related to water scarcity now, which is also related to climate change. So if we're only reporting from the surface, um, we, we're not gaining much, and we're not get, definitely not gaining much understanding. And we in Europe, we, we tend to build this fortress around us um, where people cannot enter anymore. But even if you look here in Italy, in the south of Italy or south of Spain, where there's hardly any rain anymore, where farmers have a huge issue to, uh, to, to do what they always used to do, um, it's creeping up and it, it will affect, in the end of the day, everyone. Yeah. And the a rising sea level doesn't make a distinction bet between rich or poor. Um, so, you know, I've been in Boston and Miami, and th those are seriously affected cities and, and, and will disappear in the future. Yeah. Most of the east coast of the US is, uh, is very fragile and, uh, and will be the most hard hit region in the world. Another, there is another issue that is not very much covered. Um, the fact that uh, uh, huge concentration of uh, people in uh, one place uh, uh, create, uh, cause uh, environmental problems uh, themselves. Uh, say, for instance, I went to Lebanon uh, some months ago, where uh, over the last five years, uh, one million and a half uh, people from Syria uh, uh, went to, uh, uh, who um, summed up with uh, the Palestinians uh, that in the 80s went to Lebanon and some Iraqis that uh, escaped after the war uh, broke out. So, uh, so if you go also in Beirut, in the capital, not only in the Beka Valley, I mean the, the city itself. Uh, you just uh, you just turn turn the corner and you see a refugee camp with uh, hundreds of people, hundreds of children, all in one place. They don't have um, uh, <laughs> toilets. I mean, the, the, so the, this this is a, an environmental problem that adds up to the others, you know, and and this. So uh, it is also a question of. Uh, uh, understanding, first of all, by a, a fair and uh, um, honest communication, which is one of the major problems. I read, um, I read uh, uh, very recently there was a report from the EU that said that, uh, the, as you were saying, that uh, the, 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 the media in Europe are under-equipped. Uh, to cover the phenomenon of uh, migration, and so the re but but everybody speaks about migration. If you if you just uh, um, open the TV news, uh, everybody speaks about migration. Especially in Italy, in Italy, people speak about invasion, 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 and everybody speaks about. But the fact that uh, nobody really digs, uh, deepens uh, into the problem, uh, the result is that. Uh, um, it's a very false perception of, of what the reality is. No, absolutely. So, so there are really two sides of the story. The one is like the environmental linkages and causes yeah. of the migration, and the other side is really how do you manage the migration when you get this congregation and aggregation of communities uh, and, and focusing around limited resources. Um, but I'd, I'd like to actually swivel the agenda a little bit and, and look more into the solutions. So we've highlighted you know, the problems quite clearly. Um, but in your reporting, do you also come across case studies where communities are really showing how they are adapting to climate change, how they're creating alternative livelihoods, and how um, countries are managing the migration in an effective and, and, and profitable manner? Have you? You, sh you, you see on a small scale, the, the, the problem is, how many people will be affected. So for Bangladesh, I don't really see a, a solution. If you look at smaller island states in the Pacific, that there are possibilities for different agriculture, right? You, you can 
there's a technique now that you can can grow potatoes on salt soil uh, that you can grow watermelons not horizontal but that you can grow them vertical but in the end of the day i mean i do believe that we have to really look at the future and if if you again about the pacific countries like kiribati and tuvalu those are countries those countries no matter what will disappear there's no way uh, we can save them in the next 50 years so the question is poses another question but what do you do with a country what do you do with a country that that doesn't will cease to exist and with kiribati it was quite a funny story if you would call it funny but the president there who was very aware of what was happening he decided to purchase land for his people for the country in on fiji um he bought the the a large plot of land was bought uh, from the anglican church in fiji um the problem was a little bit that it, it wasn't communicated properly with the fijian authorities so they were not very amused to learn that the country was moving to their country um <laughs> which actually shows what kind of problem uh, that we are facing mm. because you know I mean we're not talking about a few people we're talking about some countries as well um, so there are solutions there are solutions for coastal protection but even in Holland where I'm from you know we, we kind of tend to, to act like this is not going to happen to us and we have more time than many other countries because we've invested so much on coastal protection over the centuries. But sooner or later, also Holland will, will not be there anymore. So, you know, adaptation is probably the key for most regions. And that's how it used to happen in the past because the seas have gone up, the seas have gone down. It's not new what's new is that it's happening so rapidly um, and that we don't have the co capability anymore to just decide that it's time to move let me just uh, add one 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 aspect that is very much uh, is never told when we speak about forced migrants uh, we uh, europeans uh, or westerners i'd say tend to think that, that they are coming over to us. Everybody is coming to us, like we are, we are being invaded by these people. But the reality is that 94% uh, of, of these people stay in Africa or in the Middle East or in Asia Minor, and only 6% come to Europe. Mm. And out of these 6%, uh, very few, very few stay in, uh, in um, uh, southern Europe. Uh, um, so it, it's a question of perception, which is far away, absolutely far away mm. from reality. And we as media operators have a great responsibility in really communicating it the way it is. You know, This can help politicians to better tackle the problems. Because if you, are, if you start from a false point, it is very hard to, to find a real solution. Mm. Very probably you'll, you'll create more problems. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> I mean, we've, Luca, you, you've done really well in uh, giving us the numbers. So the full story is not really being told. We are at record levels in terms of migration. Um, but a lot of the migration is local, um, and you know the Western perception of it is biased. Um, we've talked a lot about the climate and environmental linkages behind the migration and how that drives the social conflict. Um, but we've also kind of talked a little bit about the solutions, the climate smart agriculture that exists, <laughs> the uh, defenses to sea level rise that one can do through natural processes like mangroves. Um, as well as the political processes. And, and maybe there, just some final messages from you. So in light of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, which was really the first global consensus to work on the climate issue together, do you think there is the political will and the global momentum to really you know, ramp up the scale of mitigation actions needed 
as well as invest in the adaptation actions required? Well, you would think so eh? until a few days ago. Um, because that the fact the fact that the US is pulling out being the biggest uh, emitter of carbon dioxide the methane the main co the, the country which produces most them pulling out uh, is uh, i think the the worst that could happen so far the the other countries the, the rest of the world seem seem to unite still and uh, it might even be that China is taking the lead now. But uh, a country which is uh, presenting itself as, uh, as intellectually capable and, and scientifically uh, very aware is, I find it mind-blowing. And the fact that they are the east coast of the US is, is most of the, one of the most threatened coasts in the, in the world where I think half of the GDP of the US comes from is under threat by sea level rise. The fact that they are pulling, uh, pulling out is kind of means that they are digging their own grave and I'm afraid many more. Yeah, that, that, yeah. if this question had been posed uh, a week ago, I would answer quite positively. But this, this was really a shocking news yeah. and, uh, and uh, which, which adds up to many shocking news that uh, we as uh, international community should deal with. Like for instance, the fact that the highest price of this climate change is being paid by the poorest countries in the world, not by us that are creating the biggest number of uh, problems <laughs> to the world. Yeah. And so the fact that one of the biggest troublemakers in the world, the USA, is pulling out is really a terrible news, really. So. But, I mean, besides the political news, there have also been a lot of other news coming out. And, and the cities, uh, the regions, um, businesses are all showing incredible momentum and uh, really scaling up their levels of commitment. And if you look at the grander question of climate action, who actually implements it? Is it not more on the local scale? Is it not the businesses, the cities, and the regions that actually bring about the shift in uh, investments on mitigation and adaptation. And, and maybe with that, you can also give your concluding remarks for our audience. Um. Yeah, I mean, the only thing we can do is, is stay positive, obviously. And I think that there's definitely, I've been at a few COPs and uh, we've all seen a few agreements. So Paris was by far the, the best. Although we do know that even the one and a half degrees limitation is, is already too much. Um, but what, you know, I mean, it, it's good to see that, that also cities and, uh, and, and states in the US are rebellious now, you know? I mean, I don't think California, New York, and quite a few other states are gonna accept uh, what, what the current administration is doing. So, you, at least there's a awareness now, you know? I mean, I think also when I was starting to, to work on this project, on the, on the sea level rise, there, there was very little interest from the media as well, because it was also assumed in the media that it was not really an issue. Uh, you know, people were like, is a few centimeters uh, in a decade? That doesn't matter. And I think there's a real understanding now that we are facing something serious and that we do carry a responsibility for the next generations to come. And um, politicians will have to move there as well on a, on a country level because I think there's often a problem specific, specifically in democracies that Politicians, if they are elected for four years, to take the responsibility and make the changes which are really ne needed, which won't make them popular among voters, um, is, is, is a problem for real action. And we see that, I see that very well in the Netherlands. You know, the Netherlands, 
we, we always thought that we would do were very well in, in Europe, solar, wind energy, and we're not, we're not. You know, we, there's a lot which needs to be done. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to meet the agreements. I think that one of the most positive uh, novelties uh, is that religions are trying to make the difference, are, are, are uh, I'd say, entering the match, are, 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 are playing, playing a role. And uh, I'm talking about uh, not only the Pope that, uh, with his encyclical letter, Laudato Si, just put the issue at the center of the reflection of the, the entire church, as well as the non-believers, I'd say, but also the Orthodox Church, also other uh, religions and other faiths are uh, trying to uh, make the difference. And I think that due to the grip that these uh, entities have uh, with people, I think that this will make uh, a change. I hope, I hope that they will make a change. Okay. Well, and, and with that, um, we've run out of time. Thank you so very much, uh, Luca and Kadir. Um, so we've really heard about the linkages between environmental and climate causes um, and migration, and then talked a little bit more about you know, what is needed to actually tackle the climate issue, how we can work with the opportunities that are presented through um, leadership at all levels, not necessarily only at the political level, um, and how you know, this is really our generation's challenge. And, and we look forward to um, hearing more about it. Uh, you also put the spotlight on the fact that you know, there is increased awareness and maybe this whole political discussion happening right now is creating a society that is more aware of climate change and what needs to be done. So uh, with that, we, we want to end the session. Uh, keep on following us on the Connect for Climate Facebook page. Engage with us with the hashtag SDG Live um, because we're at the SDG uh, media Zone here at uh, All for the Green Week um, in Bologna in support of the uh, G7 environment. Thank you so very much and see you later. <laughs>